So in this module, module, module we're going to talk about data visualization and so especially uh, some genome browser to be able to look at your sequencing data. Um, so we are going to appreciate the different data uh, visualization tool in genomics uh, to know when to use which tool and what are the benefits of certain tool versus others or in which circumstances you want to use one in preference one over the other. Uh, to get more experience with a uh, genome browser and to become an expert ideally in uh, variation inspection and we look at, we're going to look at the example of single uh, nucleotide and structural variants. Feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. So the, part, the first part would be about visualization tool, genome browser and IGV and an overview of the IGV of IGV and then we're going to look at a single nucleotide polymorphism and structural variant in detail using IGV. What about visualization tool? Uh, first, why do we want to visualize our, our data? Um, it's actually an important, important thing to do when you're analyzing data. Um, <coughs> you will run a lot of tests and a lot of statistics, but you always have to actually look at your data. It's going to be really helpful. And a good example of this is a uh, that has had been uh, produced by a statistician in the 70s, um, Hans Kamm, and he uh, created a, four, a data set of four uh, sets, which actually exactly have the same um, basic statistic. So <coughs> the average of the y value is always 7.5, the x value is always 9. Uh, you have the same variant, the same correlation, and the same linear regression. However, if you plot it, it becomes obvious that those data sets are not the same. And they all have a relationship between X and Y, pretty much a linear relationship for the first one on the top left. However, the one on the top right is not really linear, and you would need a general regression to actually model it properly. Uh, the bottom left is actually a very good linear regression plus one outlier, so you would need a robust regression for that. And the last one is an example of how an IOT layer can actually give you a good correlation, uh, which uh, it shouldn't be. So they all have a correlation of, of 0 0.8, but you can observe that the data are pretty different. And the basic statistic wouldn't give you a clue about that. Another data set that actually has just been published by a group in Toronto, it's a data service do a dozen. Um, they took a, an image of a dinosaur, and with this uh, same point, x they all, all this they have 12 image as the same x and y mean and standard deviation and correlation, but obviously they have different pattern. And they, it was the same thing. They wanted to show that uh, statistic is really good, but visualization is important as well. Um, so our visual processing, we have two uh, types, the pre-attentive and the attentive type. The pre-attentive is the cognitive uh, operation that can be performed prior to focusing attention on any particular region of an image. So that would be what you use uh, to detect Waldo on the left part of the image. Obviously, you can find, it, uh, find him uh, very easily. However, the attentive visual processing is what you're going to use to find Waldo on the beach. Right? But we want to use the pre-attentive one to uh, detect outliers and so encode it properly using pre-attentive attributes. Outliers can really be picked by your visual system. So the idea is to display your data in the best way so you can catch outliers. Um, so we can claim that the visual system is a low-cost, uh, high-performance uh, sense marker or de and debugger to identify outliers as long as you display it properly. Um, so we're going to use tool to display the, the sequencing data you're uh, going to be working on, or you are working on. There are a lot of different genome browsers, over 40 of them are available, and which one we're gonna, the, uh, you will want to use, it depends on the task you want to uh, you have to do, what kind of uh, data you have and the size of your data set, and if you have any privacy <coughs> issue about the data set, can you, do you have to only work locally or can you put your data on a cloud to be able to use um, cloud-based server, etc., etc. So I'm going to mention a few um, genome browsers such as IGV that we're going to 
looking data and using the practical just after. So UCSC <coughs> as a general browser, you probably all, all of you probably already use it. You go online and <coughs> browse the different genome. Um, there is one as part of Galaxy um, Trackster, and um, Seven <coughs> genome browser is only used. It's always used as a lot, <coughs> and it has a particularity of uh, being able to annotate your variant um, as part of the function of the browser. The, uh, the other one, like HEV, you're just looking at, but you don't have any answer. It will not allow you to annotate a particular variant, for example. So let's talk about HEV. I um, just want to mention that all the slides with the uh, logo board and seated at the top are being borrowed uh, from the board website for educational purpose. So, uh, <coughs> so, so that's why, uh, which is, where they develop IGV from. So IGV is an integrative genome viewer. It's a high performance visualization uh, tool for interactive exploration of large integrated genomic data set. And it supports a, very, very, a wide variety of data type, including arrays, next generation sequencing, and genomic annotation. So it's a desktop application for interactive and visual exploration of integrated genomic data. You can upload a large range of data type and, of course, data set uh, from epigenomic data, micro data, uh, sequencing data, um, a whole genome or an ASIC, or my, uh, copy number, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so with IGV, you can explore a large genomic data set with intuitive and easy to use interface. interface. Uh, integrate multiple type of data type with clinical and other sample information. We will see on what, how this is displayed. And view multiple uh, data from multiple sources, like it could be local, remote, or cloud-based. And uh, you can as well perform some automatic uh, tasks, um, like loading a script and saying, go to this position. Um, change this option and take a screenshot of, of, uh, of the data as it's placed and go to the next projection, etc., etc. And that would be, we will have it, uh, an example of this at the end of the practical. So the uh, data you can use in IGV could be from a server um, locally, from a from public data set, um, etc. So it really depends on which data you want to use um, and how you can upload it from different places. So the basic of IGV, you will launch IGV, you will select your reference genome, um, you will load the data, the data of interest, and navigate through the data um, to look at looking at particular position. So in general, you would run your analysis to detect SNV or structural variants. You will have a list of hit, and so you will go at this position to check that um, the read really supports what you've just been dete detected by the program you've been run, and this program you're gonna use them uh, tomorrow to detect SNV and structural variant in the, in the lab tomorrow. So you all been on the um, IGB uh, page to download it, I believe. <coughs> so that's what you must have done to get the version of IGV. And when you open IGV, you have this uh, screen that appears. So the first thing to do is to select the, the genome from the top uh, left corner. Um, if you map your genome on a reference genome, on a, if you map your genome on a particular reference genome like AG19 and you keep the default as 18 you will have a very rainbow uh, color that everything is mismatched. So it's just a clue that something is wrong with the reference genome you will load. So the first thing to do. Um, then you will load <coughs> the, the, the file for the data. This is an example of how to load file from a server. So publicly file available that are <coughs> um, as part of IGV to uh, be able to uh, do some tutorial or test. Uh, but uh, in our practical, we will load our own um, cancer uh, BAM file. Um, when you load the data, you will have uh, a screen which is like this. And I will describe the different components of it. At the top, you have the menu as you would have in any, uh, any tool. Then the toolbar, uh, especially, <coughs> no. Um, you have a, a box in the middle that, where you can uh, type the name of a gene of interest or a region that you want to go to. Um, and also the option on the right. 
Uh, the first bar at the top is the genome ruler, and you can select more or less where you want to go. Then you have the different track with the data. Um, on the left side, you have the name of the file you loaded. Then uh, if you uh, loaded some uh, attribute that would be displayed as a column, a color column. So it could be if you have different patients, uh, the, the sex of the patient or the subtype of the of the, uh, of the cancer you have or different other clinical information or information about data, about your, the data you loaded. And at the bottom you have the genome feature. Um, <clears throat> the basic thing is just to to show the genes, so the ref genes, ref sex gene, for example. But you can load the UCHG genes and sample one, or for example, a repetitive element tract as well. So different file format can be used, um, and the file format defines the track type, and each track type determines how it's going to be displayed. So automatically, IGV is going to recognize what type of data you're loading because you're going to look at the uh, the file you're loading, like if it's .bam, he knows it's a BAM, and so by default he would display it in a particular way. And then you can modify a bit the option to what you want. So here are a list of all the file tabs that IGV um, recognize. Um, a lot of them, a lot are very useful, <laughs> um, and they keep expanding in function of how the field is developing. But usually the file you will have, you will be able to open it in IGV. So when you start loading your data, you will have, you won't see in, uh, much because you need to zoom in to be able to actually see your reads. Uh, <clears throat> so that's why you have zoom in to see alignment. And how, uh, uh, what is the region you need to go, how far you need to zoom in to be able to start seeing reads, it really depends on your coverage and the memory you can use. So uh, roughly 30K, uh, but uh, if you have, um, <coughs> if you want to, use a large window, uh, you need more memory, and so in some of your laptops, it might be too demanding for them in terms of the memory you did. Um, however, if you have low coverage, so not a lot of read, you might you can use larger window because you need less memory because you have less data to load. Uh, but if you have very deep sequencing, uh, you're going to have to look at narrow window because the amount of memory used uh, is high. So there is not a particular region size, uh, but just you know you have to zoom in until you can actually see something. So um, when we load a BAM file with, so we have alignment, uh, what do we see? We see reads that have been aligned to the genome, and we see some colors, and the colors <coughs> correspond to a base that are actually mismatched. So they are not the same as the reference genome and the color in function of the being a A, C, or G, or T, right? Um, if the base has a strong color, that means the quality of the base was very good. If it's, quite, if it's a light color, uh, that means the quality of the base was not very good. So when you look at a particular uh, SNP or SNV, if all the base uh, that has a mismatch have a, not a strong color, you would not really trust it because it was not a good quality base. So what are the important metrics we want to use to evaluate the validity of SNVs? Uh, we're going to look at coverage. Um, uh, of course, you need enough read in a particular region to be confident that there is a mutation. Uh, you want to look at the amount of support, how many of my read um, um, have the mutation versus how many of my read don't have the mutation. Um, it could be a low. Uh, a low variance frequency, but still you need more than to read, for example, or even more than that. Um, we can observe if uh, is there any strand base of PCR artifact. We're going to check that the, it's a region with the mapping quality is actually good. So the mapping quality is shown in IGD by the, the gray color. So all reads that have a, a good gray color as on the screen are good mapping quality is getting more and more whitish to white when the mapping quality is bad. And the base quality is what I mentioned before. If a base has a mismatch and the color is not strong, that means the base quality was not good. So it's how those are included in IGV. Um, and the important metric for the evaluating a, a variant 
are the coverage, the insert size, and the repair orientation. And I'm going to describe those two uh, insert size and repair orientation in detail uh, just after. What does this correspond to? So when we want to look at SNP or SNVs, <coughs> this is an example, an example of a good SNP. So you can see you have a mismatch, a T to a C. The reference zero is a C, as you can see at the bottom. And you have um, a bit more than 50% of read that actually have a T. And they all have a strong red color, so we're confident that it's a real mutation at T to a C. And it's actually, if you load at the bottom the DB SNP, uh, track, it corresponds to a non SNP because there is uh, an annotation at the bottom. I wish I could point it, but I got Yeah. Fine. Um, another example of a, of a SNP or a variant mutation that you would not necessarily trust. In this case, um, if you have a region, um, a particular position with a C to an A. However, we color here the read in the orientation of the read. So the reads that go, go towards the left are blue, the read going towards the right are red. And you can see that the uh, alternative allele is only on, the, on a particular st strand, or read orientation. So you would want uh, read going in both and supporting this mutation. So you would not necessarily uh, use, uh, trust this one. What about the view in structural events? Uh, so PERID can have evidence of genomic structural events, such as deletion, translocation, and inversion. Um, so we, have, we can color the read pair in function of the, in, of the insert size, insert size, sorry, and the pair orientation. So what about the insert size? So we have the, the DNA that you want to sequence, or the, the, yes. And then it's been fragmented, uh, and then uh, what the Jared described earlier. And then the read, you're going to have pair and most of the time you have pair and read, so you're going to sequence on both hands of each fragment. So that's the arrow, what represents the black arrows. You have sequencing on both hands of your fragment. Um, <clears throat> so you, the insert size is the distance between those two uh, reads that belong to the same pair. And roughly, um, all fragments have the same length, same length, so the insert size should roughly is being the same for all pair. Um, and you can, when you have uh, <coughs> your pair read, you align them to your FN genome, and you can compute the distance between those reads, so that the inferior insert size. So we can, uh, the inferior insert size can be used to detect structural variant, such as deletion, insertion, and interchromosomal rearrangement. Uh, we're going to take the example of the deletion. So what is the effect on the deletion on an inferior insert size? At the top, you have your reference genome. At the bottom, you have the sequence you're actually sequencing, uh, which has a deletion as part in the middle. So uh, the red part in the middle has been removed, and you have a and now a, a junction between those two parts on the right and on the left. So <clears throat> if you fragment it and run your uh, read pair, you might have a pair that uh, um, cover both hands of the breakpoint. If you map those, this pair back to your reference genome, it will uh, map further apart than uh, your real sequence. So um, the infer insert side is larger than the expected value. So this is an indication we can actually use um, to detect uh, deletion, for example. And we can visualize it on IGV, with IGV. So you will do that in the practical. You will, uh, we will uh, ask for the color alignment to be color by insert size. And for example, a deletion can look like this. You have a drop of the coverage. As you can see, there is less read in the middle. And you have some red read uh, at the border, at the breakpoint, that actually have larger insert size than expected, so telling you that there are good evidence for a deletion here. Right? So that's uh, by convention, IZV use uh, will color in blue the 
insert sites that are smaller than expected, in red, uh, the insert sites that are larger than expected. And then if um, a read pair is mapped on one, one one read is mapped on one chromosome and the other read is mapped on another chromosome. Is they're going to color the reads with different color in function of where the mate is mapped to. So they have a, a one color per chromosome, and that's how you will see uh, some rearrangement. That the the color of this read indicates that the mate of this read is actually on chromosome six, and they were the original read were mapped on chromosome one. And vice versa, on the right side, you can see the read mapping on chromosome 6, and their mates are blue, or you yeah, like blue, uh, because their mate is uh, mapped to chromosome 1. So if you have region like this with um, color, um, you might, uh, <coughs> it can give you a clue that they probably on a rearrangement, uh, and you actually can click on it to actually jump to the other position. Um, what about read pair orientation? He can help uh, revealing structural variants such as uh, inversion, duplication, translocation, and complex rearrangement. And uh, the orientation is defined in terms of read strand, left to right, and read order, first and second. Um, I will exemplify that. So if we take the, the case of an inversion, so you have the sequence A, B, on your reference genome, that is actually uh, inverse in your in the sequence, your your just sequence. So it's a B to A. Then you will fragment uh, your DNA and have some uh, read pair sequencing. So we take the example of a first read pair that is around the B junction. Uh, when we map it back to the reference genome, the part on the left, we'd map to the blue part, goes to the, the normal uh, sequence, so it's not a problem. However, the part on the right will map to the reference genome close to the B, and you will have an orientation that is actually in the same direction as opposed to being like this in theory. Um, if we take the example of read pairs spamming the other breakpoint, uh, the read on the right will map, will map without any, uh, as expected. And the read on the left will map in the opposite, di the same direction on the reference genome. So <laughs> this is how your read map uh, Allen Alan read would look like. And uh, you expect the orientation being inward facing and not in the same direction. So this you can actually identify it and we will color it in a particular way to be able to highlight it. So. Um, the science, they will, co will color in silent when they have the less left side pair, because they're going from uh, left to right. And the blue one would be the right side pairs. So on IGV, we can, we can color alignment by pair orientation. And an, an example of an invasion would look like this, with both left side and right side pair at each breakpoint, like the cyan and the blue pair as I exemplified before. And you would notice a drop in coverage as well at the breakpoint. Um, so that's the convention uh, for IGV with the normal read pair that are in the right ELA with the right orientation. And then you have the in the same orientation, the cyan and the blue. And if you have outward facing um, the RL, so the last one, uh, the green one uh, exemplify a duplication or a translation. Um, so that's how you would, uh, all the different options you would use to um, highlight uh, the events you detected and check them on IGB. Um, and we actually, we're going to actually do it in the practical now. Uh, any question before we start the practical? Yes? Is the color coding for different chromosomes? Because this is human genome, so is it different for... Um, I assume they have a different color coding. They must have a color coding for every single genome they support. So you need to load the reference genome. So I don't know if IGV would load the bacterial genome or whatever genome you want to look at. But they would, if they support the genome, they would have um, a convention for which chromosome is rich color. Yeah. 